Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Natalie. She is the owner and facilitator of careblazers.com, and she has graciously accepted the challenge of talking about some of the more challenging behaviors that as caregivers have to deal with on a daily basis. So thanks for joining us, Natalie. It's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me to be here. So tell me a little bit about yourself first before we just get into all the heavy hitting stuff. Absolutely. So my name is Natalie. I'm a certified GERO psychologist, which is basically a fancy way to say that I'm a clinical psychologist and I specialize in geriatrics, especially dementia and helping family members cope with the challenges that come along with caring for somebody with dementia. I've been in a large hospital setting since 2008 where I've received my geriatric training. And what I noticed is that we were really good at diagnosing dementia, of checking in with the patients who have dementia, but we were really bad at checking in with the family members. We would just send them on their way. And I started realizing like, oh my God, during follow-up visits to check in with the patients, we could just see the family members in a lot of stress and really starting to struggle with a disease that is gonna last years probably and continue to get worse and worse and worse. And so um, that's kind of like how this all got started, where I realized, you know, places I worked were really great. We would try to do support. I would be able to like offer a caregiver support session and have them come in. But that's really hard for caregivers to do too. They're at home caring for their loved one with dementia and just the whole practice of like getting somebody ready and battling the traffic, waiting in the appointment room. So I just thought there has to be a better way. And I was getting a lot of the same questions and challenges. And so I just decided like almost three years ago to just start recording weekly videos of the common questions and challenges I see in my daily practice. And so I post them on YouTube. And there's a new vi video that goes out every Sunday where I'm just answering a lot of the questions and talking about those like serious struggles that families are facing as they care for their loved one with dementia. Cause it can be like, uh, it feels a little isolating. Like you're all alone in this. And like a lot of the families I was talking to, they feel so alone in their challenges. And I'm like, oh, if they could only see like the other caregiver I just saw, they're not alone. Um, and so that's kind of how I came into the online world. That's awesome. That's one yeah. of the reasons I started the podcast is because the once a month support group was great, but never failed. You'd have the support group meeting and then those are on Thursdays for me. I go spend time with my mom on Mondays and I would end up with some new question on Monday and, you know, practically a whole other month to get through. I would search online and those answers never always seem to fit. Yeah. And one day I was at the gym and I said, duh, I should look for a podcast. I love, love listening to them. You can listen to them while you're doing other things. And at the time, this has been just, we're just under two years that I started working on it. And there wasn't other, there wasn't really a lot of options. There's more options now than there yeah. was when I first started. So it just shows you the need. So yes. it is just a need that's going to continue growing, unfortunately. So it's great that there are options like this out there. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about, you know, caregiver stress and, you know, getting your loved one to a doctor's appointment or any kind of appointment. I, I'm, I'm right there in that battle because my, my mom's neurologist is fantastic, but the rest of the medical providers in her group seem to think I'm just taxi driver, the Uber driver. It's very frustrating. They forget that I have my own full, busy, rich, crazy life to deal with. And then I have to throw in her stuff too. It's not like, oh, well, we'll just take care of my stuff whenever we don't have to worry about mom because that's... <laughs> Be yeah. many many more years when you think about the sacrifices that it takes on a family member like i know m many of the caregivers i work with are you know they're, they're grateful that they can provide that care to their loved one but at the same time just the sacrifice of time and energy taking days off work sometimes um, and then to go to those appointments and just to feel like you're just kind of off to the side or you're not really fully engaged 
I truly believe if we want to, if the healthcare community wants to provide the best absolute dementia care for somebody with dementia, we have to start paying attention to the family members taking care of them. Oh, I fully agree. And that's one of the things I love about her neurologist. We've had two appointments in 2019, the beginning of the year and in September, and mom has declined quite a bit in that time frame, which surprised the, the doctor. And she could see a lot of the new struggles and with, you know, mom struggling and my struggling to help her. And the best thing she did as we were leaving is she told me, you know, you're doing a really great job. I know it's hard. And it was like, just that one statement. I was like, oh, thank you. Cause yeah, this is really pain in the butt. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice to be acknowledged and to realize, you know, like to receive thanks for somebody who realized what you're doing. A lot of times our loved ones with dementia, they don't realize everything that you do. Um, And in a way that can be a good thing, but uh, it can feel like a thankless job sometimes. Yes, that's totally true. So let me throw out the big tough question that we're dealing with my mom right now. As I mentioned, she has declined she had a big dip, a big decline, more than she's had in the past. Now, we've been dealing with her Alzheimer's for probably close to 20 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a long journey. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always been kind of subtle, you know, dips in ability and cognition. And, and this, one was, this one was so dramatic that I thought she had a UTI, which I've yeah. mentioned several times on different episodes and she didn't and it just it was just a new normal that literally seemed to hit overnight and one of the challenges now my my mom is in a memory residence and she needs she needs assistance with daily living showering dressing but she fights it tooth and nail i mean i was helping her the other day the decline has required the pull-ups because she seems to have an issue with, I got to go to the bathroom right now. I'm like, you just went. I'm like, do you really have to go? Or it's, it's confusing. And she was struggling to put the underwear on. And I said, I'm right here if you want my help. And she struggled and she struggled and she struggled. And I finally just, she was getting her foot caught in the hole, which, you know, we all do sometimes. And when I helped her, you would have thought that I'd smacked her and said, ah, I'll take care of it. And just, you know, was, was, was really obnoxious about it. And I was really subtle about it. And the caregivers have also said that she fights them so hard with the shower that one person has to basically hang on to her hands while the other person washes her hair and scrubs her body. And I'm like, that's not fun for anybody. So I don't know if there's a way of helping them help her through that because she gets so angry when somebody helps her. Yeah. And then when they're helping her in that kind of manhandling kind of way, I thought, Ooh, that's, that's something I'm going to have to try to solve. Yeah. It's challenging because you're talking about something that she's been doing for most of her life on her own. And it's a really private thing. And so when you think about somebody who, is no longer able to do like the basic functions, that's scary. It could be scary if she doesn't fully understand why people are trying to help her with very private, intimate duties and tasks. You know, like, why are these people trying to, you know, touch me here or help me in the bathroom? This feels like I should be alone. Um, Other times they realize they can't do it and it's just incredibly frustrating that they're, you know, a thing that is a very private thing, but all of a sudden they have all these people trying to help. Um, There's a lot of different approaches and ways to manage something like this. Um, For starters, I just want to say like, it's good you ruled out a UTI, right? Because where there is a sudden change like that, we want to make sure nothing else is going on, especially since I heard you say like, she's still asking that she needs to go to the bathroom after she just went. Mm -hmm. The fact that you ruled that out is really great. Um, I think especially for somebody who, you know, might feel a little bit, uh, prideful and have a hard time accepting help. When we say things like, I'm right here, if you want my help, chances are they're probably not going to take you up on that. They don't want to admit they even need the help. 
So in some ways we have to get really creative and find ways to offer the help without them, without calling attention to it, without saying you're helping. I mean, obviously you are, and they might even be able to realize it in some cases, but you just want to just as naturally as possible, like, oh, you know, those, um, I get my foot stuck in my hole all the time too. Here, let me just like unhook it for you. Like as natural and as comfortable as possible, the more uncomfortable the caregiver is, the more uncomfortable and difficult the care situation is going to be. And it's really challenging in a case that you're describing right now, because since she's shown some difficult behaviors, everybody going in to help her right now is probably a little bit tense and on edge. Like, okay, what's it going to be today? Is she going to lash out? Right. And so already everybody is like in this tense mode. And for somebody who's had Alzheimer's for 20 years, like, even though she might be able to still understand language and words, she's definitely picking up on nonverbals way more than any words coming out of anybody's mouth. So as hard as it's gonna be, you know, before anybody goes in there to help her with any care, couple of deep breaths, tell yourself you got this, you're gonna be as, try to be as comfortable and as casual as, you know, as you can be with the whole thing. And just being very mindful of like any tension in the face. Like you want to go in there and smile. I would encourage caregivers to have like a topic of discussion or a joke ready or something in the new, something that they know your mom is into to have that already like available in the mind. So when they go and they start giving her a bath or something, they can say, you know, did you see the snowfall today? Or, you know, did you, um, what did you think about so-and-so singing at the talent show last night? Whatever, like whatever she would be interested in um, to kind of start, you know, having some of that like pleasant conversations all the way around just the care task. And then because it sounds like it's awful, right? Could you imagine uh, like somebody trying to bathe you while somebody's touching your body while you're holding on to their hands? But that's scary. That, I mean, that's not pleasant at all. And so as in tasks like this, I encourage family members like, okay, give, let them help in some way, right? And I'll say help like this, like give them something to hold. Is it an extra washcloth? Here's a washcloth for you. You can do your arms, right? The caregiver might still need to go back over the arms, but you're keeping them busy. You've got a pleasant conversation going on. You've checked yourself, like we're basically mirrors for our loved one with dementia. So you've checked yourself that that's in order. Um, and really like just trying to be as comfortable as possible yourself to try to help that be as comfortable as possible for the person with dementia. And just realizing like we can either approach care tasks from two different angles. We can be like tense and frustrated. Like, why doesn't she just make this easy? She's making it harder for everybody. Or we can approach it as with a sense of compassion. Like this has got to be one of the hardest things. Like I know I don't look forward to that ever happening to me. Um, and just like, how can we approach it with as much calm and compassion as possible? Those are just a couple ideas I have like off the top of my head. And I, I really think kind of going in there with having some sort of joke conversation, pleasant pleasantry, but also getting her involved in the help. Give her a loofah, give her a washcloth, give her something. People don't have to be holding her hand. She can engage in the activity. No, I'll definitely suggest that because I know some of the comments that I've gotten in the last few months, you know, my mom was really easy. You know, she's very um, mobile. So all of her functioning, I like her physical functioning was fine. It was just her brain that didn't work. And that's changed. But she's gotten to the point where she lashes out verbally and she sometimes swears at them which is embarrassing but i understand that's normal and so when i was there this this past week and they're telling me all the lovely things that she was saying to them i just just reiterated some of the stories from when i was a teenager and you know your life was fine if you did things her way and yeah. if you crossed her sometimes that was a very unpleasant situation she held a grudge to, on me for a month. Oh my. Did not speak to me unless she absolutely had to. It yeah. was horrible. I mean, I remember, I don't even remember what I did. I just remember it was just, it was horrible. And so when I told them that, because they've only seen the sweet, easy, nice little old lady, and now she's like, you know, snapping at them when, you know, if you put something in her hand, like, you know, they have to hand them their medication. 
you know, she'll just like, I handed her a small paper plate, white paper plate with a dark, rich chocolate spice bread on it. And she's literally waving the plate around. And I'm like, hey, there's food on this plate. Like, taste it. And she's just looking around like, huh, what? And I was like, okay, this is a really interesting development now. So, okay. So I broke off a piece. I held on to the plate so she'd stop flinging it around at me. <laughs> and I said, here, here's the, here's the bite of bread. Try it. You'll love it. And she finally did, but holy Toledo, I was like, if it was vanilla cake on a white plate, I'd get it. Because no contrast. But it was like, who couldn't have gotten a bigger contrast in the food? And so it's, and it's been fairly sudden and dramatic, this change, so they have to change. So I will definitely give them those suggestions. Because when I, we had a visit, mom and I, about a month ago, I was very frustrated and stressed just with my own stuff and we had a crappy visit yeah. and I was like man I should have taken the husband up on the suggestion to reschedule my whole week so I could move mom to a different day <laughs> but I didn't yeah. and I regretted it and yeah. I when I go to visit I always anticipate that it's going to be because sometimes when I show up she's stressed out you know she feels like she's wet she needs to change her clothes she can't figure out how to change her clothes so it's just distress and undress which is very difficult to say i haven't had that in a, over a month but for a while it was like that every time and as soon as i was like okay you know what's she gonna be stressing about today i stopped having that work you know she's not doing that so it's like okay well if i expect the worst then i don't i don't immediately have that negative physical reaction when it is that bad because i've already anticipated it so that's that helped me yeah and mindset's really important I've, obviously if our loved ones with dementia could just change based on saying hey stop waving the plate around hey let me just put you know help you with your briefs hey let me just wash your hair without you hitting or whatever right? if, if we could just say that and they would just change well then we'd have no need for like your podcast or my youtube it's you'd say hey don't do this and they'd say okay right but clearly like there's like disconnection happening in the brain those are all signs like they're super struggling and so whenever um care blazers ask me you know how do i get my loved one to change how do i get my loved one to change the way you get your loved one to change is by you changing right and and sometimes it's it's trial and error we don't get it right sometimes from the very first approach but a, a lot of it is mindset right our approach like for some reason, like nobody signed, like when you have a loved one with dementia, you start to learn pretty quickly, there's going to be challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And despite that, you continue to care for them. You continue to love them and you continue to do what you can to help them. So you're, you're literally signing up to care for your loved one, knowing that there's all these challenges and you're not going to have all the answers right away. And you're not going to respond the best way every time. Nobody does. We're human, right? Um, but it's just like, just going in there knowing I'm just doing the best that I can with a really complicated disease that not only, um, is it challenging no matter what it changes with time. Just like with your mom, like you, you and the, um, res the facility that she lives at, like you guys have all been interacting with her in a certain way and it's been fine. Now, all of a sudden she's had another stage of decline and you guys are all having to learn how to interact in a different way. If you continue to try to approach her and interact with her the way that you always have, you got everybody's going to get frustrated. The behaviors are going to get worse, right? But if you say, okay, now's another sign, like how can I change? This is another stage in the disease. Things are more complicated for her, probably more difficult for her than ever. Like what can I do and tweak? So, I mean, what, what you did with just mindset is really important. I talk a lot about coping statements. Like what's your coping statement? Like what's going to get you through a difficult time? I encourage care blazers to come up with one or two coping statements that really feel true for them. We can't just lie to ourselves and say, this is the best thing I've ever done. You know, but there are some days we, you just want to pull your hair out. I'm sure. Right. Um, so you kind of have to say like, if you have a sense of humor, you can say, all right, let, I'm going to go with 10 times. She says something rude for, to me today on this. Right. Or if you're just somebody who gets a lot of drive from like inspiration and um, positive encouragement, you could just say, you know what? I got this. Whatever happens today, I got this. And I'm just going to take 
uh, joy in knowing I spent time with my mom today, right? Like, and, and whatever it is, like you, you know what it is, you recite it in your head. And when you're right there in front of her, or when you find like that, those feelings come up and you're struggling, you just go to that coping statement over and over in your, in your brain, because what determines our feelings is our thoughts. Like the way we feel is always determined by the way we think. So if you're thinking she's making life miserable for everybody, this is awful. You know, she's saying things that's embarrassing. Like that's all going to lead to negative emotion. But if you change your thoughts and you, and you take some time to come up with some coping statements that are good for you, um, you can, that, that can be helpful. That is good. I, I don't think I actually have one other than I just keep telling myself I'm doing the best I can. I know she doesn't understand that not going to get that kind of acknowledgement from her. So I don't, I don't expect it. I'm not hoping for it. Yeah. At least I hope I'm not hoping subconsciously for it, maybe a little bit. Yeah. But it was interesting after assisting her in the bathroom with getting her underwear on, we, what I was, had been doing was, you know, to keep her two years ago, she was not changing clothes. Every time I'd show up, she was wearing the same sweater. And I found out she was, you know, she's wearing the same sweater as 110 degrees. I'm like, hello, what? No. And I, in my head, her closet was so small compared to what she'd had in her home that I didn't recognize that it was still too much. And the facilitator of my support group said, have like seven tops and three or four pairs of pants. And I'm like, duh, that's like, <laughs> like I should have thought of that. That's so obvious. So I took all of the winter clothes away and kept them at my house. And then we've gone from low to mid eighties to low seventies, like overnight. And we were, I was there. I was like, Oh shoot. Should have brought your winter clothes because you know, I know that she's, she's always a little colder than I am. So I was hanging up all of her clothes and she was just like, I just get so angry when people are bam, 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 and it was just a bunch of words and she wandered off and down the hall and I'm like, hmm, okay, I guess our visit's over. And I continued to hang up clothes because that's what I needed to do. And I didn't, I figured I'll just let her go cool off because she needed it. I figured she'd forget half, you know, three or four steps down the hallway, what she was grumping about. And she came back and I got this sense that she was happy to see her quote best friend that's she thinks i'm her best friend even though she was mad at me for helping a few minutes ago now she was happy to see me and i was like oh, i'm glad i didn't leave i'm glad i still had something to do that kept me here because then we had you know we had a, another 20 minutes of pleasantry and then it was time to go because it was dinner time for them so it was interesting that i didn't let her mood affect me and i just kept doing what i needed to do and I think when she came back in the room, she was much happier. And she, I think she was happy to see somebody that she knows does fun things with her. Like I try to take her out. We go to the park and watch kids. And you know, we go to the swimming pool and watch kids. We go to the library and we watch kids. We go, we watch kids. It's a little trickier now it's getting cold. But, you know, she, she actually started asking me, well, where are we going to go today? And I thought, man, that's really incredible. I yeah. guess we go out enough now that that's just been programmed. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you said a couple of things that kind of triggered my mind in different ways. Like you never thought like maybe having too many clothes was part of the reason why she was struggling. And that's why it is good to, you know, be a part of support groups, um, in person, online, whatever it is to get some different ideas. Whenever it comes to trying to figure out what a strange behavior is, or why this might be like, why is this person wearing the same sweater over and over, whatever it may be, we're not going to solve it from our brains. Like we kind of have to go into that other person's brain, like from you know, like, what in the world could this mean that my mom is wearing the same sweater every day? And, and you brainstorm, you'd say, well, maybe it means like she's always cold. No, nah, that's not right. Maybe it means she is afraid to take her top off. Maybe it means the closet's overcrowded. Like you start to get into the detective mindset. You remove the frustration and emotion of why are you still wearing the same sweater to, okay, let me, let me go into my mom's shoes and try to figure out what this might look like in her mind. So always joining their world is a really good thing to keep in mind. And then also is, I mean, it's great that you stayed. You had a goal. You wanted to 
you know, fix your closet and then you were able to have a positive interaction because you stayed and you didn't leave, it's important to try not to take things so personally. And so sometimes what I, well, a lot of times what I talk to my care blazers about is, you know, try not to listen so much to the words, right? The words might be like, I don't need you. You're always trying to give me help I don't need. Um, why don't you just go away? Like whatever the word is, like the words can be hurtful. I want you people to try not to take it so personally, but try to focus on what's the emotion behind those words, right? So the emotion behind the word is frustration or anxiety or fear or sad, whatever it is. If we can just say, what is it? What is that emotion that's underneath all those words? We can respond to the emotion without getting into this back and forth of trying to, you know, get caught up in the sentences and the words where everybody's going to leave frustrated, you know? So can, you could just simply say, you know, if she wasn't walking out the door or whatever, she was kind of saying something and getting worked out. You can sim simply say, seems like you're really frustrated or this is really hard for you. I mean, you don't even have to respond. Like our working human brains want to respond rationally like we would with a coworker, with a neighbor, with a friend. But what happens with our loved ones with dementia, is sometimes it doesn't go anywhere. It just makes everybody more frustrated. So you don't necessarily have to give like a rational response when they're saying some of these things. You can just say, this is really difficult or you seem really upset or I'm sorry you're going through this or you know, this is a hard day. I mean, just whatever the emotion is, acknowledge it. Don't be afraid to have a little conversation about that. If there is one, if there isn't one, that's fine. And then look for the next opportunity to distract or change the conversation to, oh man, did you remember this sweater? You look so good in this sweater. I remember the last time you wore it, right? It's just, you're looking for that window of opportunity versus trying to come to a closure of why she's frustrated. It's just, this is a hard day. Yeah, that's ex excellent advice. And it's, I think it's excellent for caregivers like myself that are the adult child of the person with Alzheimer's. I'm sure it's similar with spouses, but I have that history with her of never seemed like anything I ever did was good enough. And there are days when that is amplified now. And it's just yeah. really frustrating because it's like, hey, this is good as it's going to get, honey. So you better accept it. And I know she can't, so it's just, I have to, I have to remind myself of what you were saying is just try not to take it personally, which if I'm relaxed, I can pretty much accomplish that. If I'm stressed and frustrated and my mind is going, you know, scrolling through the to-do list of all the, you know, things that need to be done instead of just sitting in the park watching children that aren't mine or my neighbors or anybody I know, I, ha I have a tendency to get you know, like tense and then she gets tense and then there's that snapping, snarling cat action going on. And that's just terrible for both of us. So yeah, you guys would just feed off of that. And, you know, I do hear a lot like from care blazers who are caring for a parent who maybe wasn't the greatest parent. Right. And so when something happens in the caregiving journey where the parent says something rude or nasty or mean, the caregiver, the adult child, isn't just responding to that comment. They're responding to that comment in years of hurt and pain of not having a, a parent who maybe was kind and loving. And so what I encourage caregivers in that situation to do is, then why are you caring for your loved one with dementia? It may not be, you may not be caring for your mom and visiting your mom and doing all these things because she was the greatest mom. That's okay. But you may be doing it because of whatever sense of um, pride or joy it brings to you to know that you're going to be as good of a daughter as you can be, right? Just because maybe she wasn't as great of a mom doesn't mean like you're, you're, you are deciding, you're making the choice every day to show up and care for your mom, right? And, and you're not doing it. It's okay that you're not doing it um, because she was the greatest mom. She wasn't. We don't have to lie to ourselves, but you can say, you know what, I'm doing this anyway because this is what I feel is right in my heart. That's exactly what I do, you know, because my dad passed away just right after my 50th birthday. Literally, my daughter moved out February 1st, 2017. My dad died March 2nd. And that's when I, I had learned in that interim that he just assumed she was going to come live with me. And I thought, ha, ha, ha that's, that is not happening. I finally got rid of the kid. Not, I'm not saddling myself with somebody else. I have my own needs, my own goals, and my husband and I still work. And I knew one week together, 
would, you know, I'm not that nurturing. So <laughs> there's a reason I have one child. So I thought, you know, this isn't, this isn't the right choice for her either. You know, you've got two adult people that are in and out of the house. My husband and I work from home. I'm like she'd have to have somebody here to, to take care of regular needs, especially as she declines, but she needed stimulation. I mean, she, you can't, she can't track a TV show. She couldn't do that three years ago. So there's, you know, there's, that was, I just knew that was the wrong answer. And she doesn't do any of most, she doesn't do most of the activities where she lives, but at least there's people that she tries to help the other residents. You know, she, she uses the, her nurturing skills that she has and her, she's really one of the, she's really big on like the housekeeping, the hostessing behaviors. And she always asks me, what have I been up to lately? You know, what's my family been up to? Those are the questions. That's about the only thing she ever asked me. And then I give her an answer and she doesn't understand because that's not, it doesn't make sense in her mind because what she's hearing isn't what she's expecting. So that's always kind of funny. I've kind of started answering with, and she'll say, well, so what have you been up to lately? Oh, the usual, you know how it goes. Just really super basic because if I, one time I told her exactly what I'd done and she just looked at me and she goes, Oh, bullshit. <laughs> I went, excuse me? Like, this is my life. You asked me. I was like, shocked. Like, why didn't you tell me that? It was so funny. I, mean, I, I took it as funny because it, it just hit me funny. But it, it was like, really? You're arguing with me about what I'm doing? <laughs> yeah. So I have yeah. one other thing that she does that I've, I've got online people that I talk to a lot. And... I watched her do this on Monday. She went into the bathroom. She got probably two and a half feet of toilet paper and folded it up. And then she sticks it in her hand and just hangs onto it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, did what, you know, and half the time I don't know if it's clean or dirty. So it's kind of weird. I don't understand this. She, half the time, most of the time she doesn't remember it's even in her hand. Mm -hmm. I'll ask her like, oh, what's in your hand? And she'll look at it and go, huh, what? What's in your mm -hmm. hand? Yeah, so there's definitely a pattern here of your mom wanting to do something with her hands. That's, that's, yeah, hard to and, argue with that one. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if, you know, wasting toilet paper is, or fear that she might take dirty toilet paper or something that is bothersome, you know, coming up with something, you know, to, brainstorming with the care facility about like having her hold something or help something or just checking to make sure she has something safe in her hands whenever possible might be a not a bad idea. Now I guess I guess we're gonna have to have a big conversation. The other thing too is she's had the same purse. My daughter's almost 28. I think she's had this purse almost as long as we've had the daughter. It's filthy and disgusting. <laughs> I would love to get rid of it but Occasionally she'll ask, you know, oh, do I have my purse? And we went out and she, when we came back, she had left the purse in the car. So I picked it up and just carried it. I'm like, I'm not even going to remind her. And when I, I'm like, what's in here? And I unzipped it and it was literally stuffed full of tissues and toilet paper. I was like, this is just bizarre. And there was like one sock. There was one other thing in there, but it was probably 98% toilet paper. So, yeah, and so we can try to go from that, you know, joining their world, what in the world could this mean that she has toilet paper, you know, trying to think about that, but also, I, a lot of things that people with dementia do don't make any sense to us, right? Like, we can't figure it out, and I sometimes encourage careblazers to think, like, is this something that you need to change, right? There are so many battles that you could have. When it comes to caring for somebody with dementia, you have to choose your battles wisely. And so if the behavior that they're doing is not a safety risk to herself or to others, you have to ask yourself, is this a battle I want? And maybe changing the purse is a battle you want because maybe you're concerned about um, health or, you know, um, things being sanitary, you know? And so, you know, the next time she leaves her purse in the car, is that an opportunity to switch out a purse? How would that go? I don't know. Right? I mean, a lot of this is trial and error, 
But if, if it's not a safety risk, and she's not literally grabbing toilet paper with feces on it or something like maybe that's an okay thing for her. Otherwise you can try to give her something else in her hands. Um, and you can try to switch out the purse and see how that goes without calling attention. So a lot of times we want to help our loved ones with dementia, but we call attention to it. We want to say it's time to clear out the closet and get the winter clothes in, which means that you think that they can't manage all of their clothes anyway, right? It's, it's just like another sign, like here goes something I'm not doing again, versus just saying, oh, I was in the neighborhood and oh, I just got this urge, like it's the temperatures are cooling, like I'm, I want, you know, some awesome, I want you to have some awesome sweaters or, you know, it, it's really about like the tact and the approach that you take. Um, and when you offer help, like we never want to say like, do you want help with that? Let me know. Or it's just kind of like, Hey, you know, check out this awesome purse. It's so beautiful for her because she's so attached to that one purse. You might not want to call attention to it and see what happens. Um, you could try to, if she's really, you know, hang on to that old purse, see what you can do to kind of clean it up. Like if she left it over in the car, and, and you're worried that switching out a purse without her awareness would lead to a lot of issues. You could try it, keep the old purse on hand. <laughs> Is that time to try to clean it up yourself? Um, you know, without calling attention, like, let me clean it. I need your purse to clean it. You just do it. That makes sense. I, I would never that. try to switch it out because I'm curious to find out, like, she was wearing a three-quarter length sleeve, like, t-shirt kind of blouse. And it was just chilly enough when we were there that one of the items that had been stored at my house was just kind of like a lightweight cardigan. And it's, it's a handkerchief hem, which if people aren't into fashion, they might not understand that term, but you can look it up. <laughs> and I just, I helped her into it mostly because it kept falling out of the bag. And as we were, winding down our visit she's like well this isn't mine now is it and i'm like oh yeah that's yours i said that looks so good on you and i did a lot of the things that you recommended but i'll be curious to see if it's still in the closet next week and if it's not it's okay like you, you take your small wins like that was a decent interaction you know and like that was a fine interaction you gifted your mom something and if she do doesn't have it later she doesn't have it later but again we don't take that personally and we just enjoy that we had that nice interaction when you first gave it to her. Yeah, what I I had texted my sister just to let her know that I had handled that. And I reiterated the story that I just told you. And I'm like, of course I didn't think to check that her name was in all of the items of clothing until after I was gone. Yeah. I'm like, oh well, you know, my my problem. Let me learn. Yeah. It yeah happened. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do. And I used to have a Sharpie in my purse and I need to throw one back in there, but all of these clothes had been there before. So like in my head, they weren't new, so they didn't need to be marked and they might've needed to be marked. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think about that until it was too late. So we'll see, we'll see what's still there. Hopefully, yeah. you know, I mean, even if it's been a week, she wouldn't recognize it and it's been months. So if, if it goes away, I'll just, she has enough money, I'll give her something else and hopefully it won't disappear. <laughs> and something you might want to try just for yourself, and it's kind of on my mind right now since it's November 1st and I just kicked off a gratitude practice inside one of my closed groups, is that, you know, there's a lot, we don't need any help finding what's wrong with our loved ones and finding what's wrong with our life and what could improve. Our brains are actually hardwired that way. It's called a negativity bias. It's the reason we've survived as a species. It means our brain is working. But there's a lot of research that shows like if we could just practice being grateful for some things, we start to train our brain to look for things. So when you visit your mom, like you might give yourself a challenge, like I'm going to find one positive thing about this interaction, or I'm going to leave here and I'm going to ask myself like, what's one thing I'm grateful for from this visit? And and I would encourage you as much as possible to make it different every time. It doesn't need to be anything big. It could be, you know, that my mom smiled at somebody when they walked by or that my mom, um, you know, didn't, you know, curse at anybody or that my mom came back and was glad I was still there when I was hanging up clothes, right? But just kind of, you are on purpose training your brain to start seeing some of the good that's been there. It's always been there. Our brains just don't see it because we're not hardwired that way. And once you start a practice like this, 
it starts to have a ripple effect. And again, because you're kind of that mirror and the nonverbal behaviors are really important, um, your loved one may pick up on that positive change and in the interactions, you might see some improvement overall. I think you will. Well, the starting every day with listing things that you have to be grateful for is a very good way to help combat stress. I'm working on that with my husband because he is very, very busy with his business. And right now we have a, a, we have three golden retrievers. The youngest one is at the vet again all day. He was there on the 30th. Was, apparently he ate something toxic. Oh no. Yeah. You know, so it's money. You know, we're worried about the dog. My husband's very attached to this dog. And of course now, you know, we're up to like 1200 bucks trying to figure out what's wrong with this dog. So it's just one little stress after another on top of busy on top of, you know, just, and I keep trying to like go outside, breathe some fresh air, get some sunshine on your face, look at the mountain and just take five minutes and just run through your mind, all the things that you're grateful for. And as soon as you realize, man, I have a lot to be grateful for. It makes it a lot easier to say, okay, you know, the vet caught the hawks and on the dog, you know, he was not, he, dog was basically unable to walk. He looked like he'd been drinking for days, which obviously we don't do that to our dog. And it was scary. It's like, we've had dogs forever and I've never had that experience. So, yeah. you know, and then he seemed fine yesterday and then today he's not fine. So it's like, okay. Yeah. But we're home. What happened with the dog this morning? My husband saw it and they went to the vet. You know, it's not like we got, had to wait till we got home from work and it was late and well, the dog's not acting normal. And then we got to wait till the next morning. You know, it's just like, there's yeah. a lot, even though this is not a fun situation, there's still things to be grateful for. And I'm, I'm trying to help him through that. Yeah. And I, I just remind myself when I visit my mom, it's like, I know she, she can't, she appreciates the, the little adventures that I take her on. And I'm, I've been kind of counseled to be careful on overstimulating because we've gone to the fabric store a couple times. That place is huge. She used to be this excellent seamstress and very creative and did a lot of crafts and woodworking and all kinds of stuff. So she very much enjoys the fabric store, but it's when we were there a couple weeks ago, it was, I'm not sure they can ever keep it clean and organized and tidy. And there was stuff on the floor and she's always picking up stuff off the floor. <laughs> we stopped picking up. Like, I think this is dirty. Don't pick this up. Yeah. And I just, I just try to remind myself I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to give her small joys as often as I can, because that's all she's got left. I don't, I don't know what else to do for her. Yeah. So that's, I, I do what I can. And we're all kind of learning on this journey. And yeah. if we have a bad day, we have a bad day. She won't remember. So it's like, I do have to remind myself, she won't remember if we have, you know, tense words at each other. I just have to let that go. So that's, that's my, yeah. my mantra. She may not remember specifically the tense words that you've had, but over time, if every visit continues to be tense, what she will remember is the emotion that you bring every time you come and then the visits won't be well. This is why a lot of you know people ask me to get frustrated when they're the main caregiver, why their loved one with dementia seems like they're really difficult and challenging with them. But when a neighbor or a friend or another family member comes by who doesn't provide much care, the person seems happy-go-lucky, fine. And family members and friends are like, they're not that bad. I don't know what you're... It's like, okay, that's your loved one with dementia responding to day after day, visit after visit, all of that tension. So I do encourage caregivers. I mean, we're all, there's going to be tense moments. It's just part of it. Um, and yeah, it's a benefit for some of us when the memory is so bad that they're not going to remember specific details on things. But um, there's something called subconscious memory that sticks around um, and that can really impact the relationship and that's what I don't want to see happen with your mom and the people who are helping her be I don't want that to become a pattern like we've got to you know figure out a way to make that more pleasant yeah that was that was I'm like I'm so glad I'm talking to Natalie this week because we're going to ask that question because I'm I'm sure my mom is not the only one making showering that kind of challenge yeah so I'm sure you know I know all this advice even though if it's not a hundred percent 
specific to like, you know, maybe you're having a different challenge with showering. It still can help. But I was like, oh, we're going to talk about that one because I, I knew that if every time they shower her, it's unpleasant, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse until I don't know what they're going to do. And I'm not sure I want to. And try and to I, make it as comfortable as possible, making sure like everything they need is within arm's reach. They're not like having to like take time to put her clothes on. It's like right there. If she likes music, having on some of her favorite music while they're doing it, you know, making sure like, is the temperature okay? And like, even make it fun. Like I got you the, um, these new fluffy pajama pants. I can't wait to put on you or check out this really awesome, like super soft towel. I got like, make it a little bit lighthearted and fun and special. Now, I'll definitely suggest that because I can't, I, I, I don't see it going in a positive direction. And so that was why I was really excited we were chatting. And even without our conversation today, that was kind of top of the mind on, I need to help them make this better for all of them, not just mom, but you know, mm -hmm. if mom is combative and they're battling her, I mean, it's just, ugh. that's not the way anybody wants to start their day. No, I do have a playlist. So like on my YouTube channel, I've got a bunch of videos, but there's a playlist for challenging behaviors or difficult dementia behaviors. It's worded something like that. But if you go to that playlist, it's most of my videos just about challenging behaviors and toileting is on there. Bathing is on there. Um, kind of saying rude and nasty things. It might be helpful as just a refresher for you or even the caregiver workers, if they're just wanting to learn more you know, different approaches. Cause in the end, it's going to make everybody feel better. Um, it's going to make their job a lot easier. Yeah. I'll definitely link that in the show notes so people can refer yeah. to that when they need to, because the more, I've learned that the more knowledge I acquire about the disease and how to take care of her. And I share that with the care caregivers where she lives and my listeners, it just, it makes the, it makes dealing with it a lot easier, which is saying something because dealing with it is not at all easy. Now, is there any other, there must be challenging behaviors that you hear or get questioned about frequently that I haven't brought up today. Oh my gosh. We would, I could be here all day. We can go all, all kinds of challenging behaviors. Um, a lot of them like for spouses, you know, is the person cheating on you? Like they have a lot of like, you know, paranoia about that. There's delusions, really fixed, strong beliefs that aren't true, that the person believes to be true, or hallucinations where the person is seeing things that aren't there. How do you respond to that? Um, people who are just like, you know, have no more social filter, so they're just saying like really, really nasty, rude things. Um, sometimes they get really hypersexual, and so sometimes they might start to do things or undress themselves in, you know, public places and things like that. I mean, there's no shortage of difficult behaviors when it comes to, um, you know, types of behaviors that somebody with dementia might have, but really just making sure you're keeping your caregiver stress in check so that you can respond best to those behaviors when they happen, really working on your mindset, coming up with your coping strategies. Gratitude every day is a really great one. And specifically, if you can work in gratitude of like, what are you grateful for with your loved one? Like what, what positive interaction or thing did you notice about your loved one? Because we could really quickly get to a point where we're starting to get really resentful toward our loved one and we don't want to be there. Um, but a lot of it is just detective trial and error, trying to join their world, figuring out what's going on. Let's try this approach. Did it make it worse? Did it make it better? Take that feedback and then do it again. Because one caregiver's journey is one caregiver's journey. Right? You, you've got a caregiver and you've got a person with dementia. And so even if it's the same stage, the same type of dementia, the same age of the caregiver, you know, there's different family situations, different job situations, different health situations. Um, it, no journey is the same. That's completely okay. What's right for one caregiver may not necessarily be right for another. And that is all right. Yeah, that's what I've noticed is everybody has similarities and then their challenge, you know, we have similar challenges and then different ones that you're like, oh, I'm glad I don't have that challenge. Like my mom, she gets verbally obnoxious when you've made her angry, which, okay, we all get like that. But she's so socially, like she almost wants to help somebody and, you know, well, let me know if I can do anything to help you. I have a hard time not laughing when she says that to one of the other residents. Cause I'm like, you guys really can't help each other that much, but 
if it makes you guys feel better to say stuff like that, that's great. And that's what I noticed is she's like, she's got that like hostess attitude. So she's not just spewing nasty, vile stuff at people. Thank goodness. (laughs) I mean, definitely. So she's picking up stuff on the ground in a store. She's wanting to help people. She has a hard time accepting help probably because she's used to being in the helper position. This is really valuable information for you in the residential like care facility to realize, you know, use it take advantage of it. Like, oh, I could really use your help today, you know, with the shower. Like, can you just wash your arms for me today or your feet? Or I could really use your help right now, um, you know, with the meal. Like, can you just make sure that um, you keep, you know, the, the cup in this area or whatever it might be. Or like whenever they can like praise her for offering help, whenever they need her to do something, if they can in their mind find a way to phrase it as, can she help with it? even if she's not really like, that's all the better. It's going to improve her confidence. It's going to make her feel better. It's going to encourage her to be social. It's going to take down some of that stress and frustration. Like, you know, this about your mom, like this hostess, this cleaner, this helper, like frame whatever you can as a way that she's actually helping. And you guys might get really far. No, definitely. That's that's something I've been hearing so you're not the first person to say that so i'm definitely going to bring it up with them like somebody suggested well have her like help pass out the meals Eh. problem is is at this point you give her something and she's like what am i doing with this like go give it to you know Susie. well so you you got to give her a task that's not going to make it so much more work for everybody else right right a meal that's a big deal because everybody needs a meal but if you hand her a pile of napkins and you say can you pass these napkins out to everybody and if she doesn't what's the harm it's really no big deal people are going to go get you know somebody else will bring her napkins people still have their food so it, you also have to be mindful of what task am i giving this person are they able to do it and if they didn't do it well or if they didn't do it perfectly is there a big risk Probably not when it comes to passing out napkins, but there is a big risk when it comes to passing out food. So it's just kind of considering the different approaches there. But as much as possible, it's really important for people to feel valuable, to feel worthwhile, to feel like they have meaning in life, no matter what stage of dementia they're in. And so find ways to let her help in a way that is feasible. (laughs) That's the challenge right there. What can she actually help with? That doesn't yeah. make more work for everybody else. Well, and, and it's it's also just a check for people to realize, like, it doesn't have to be done perfectly. It's okay, right? And maybe it's something like, here's a bunch of coupons. Can you sort them? They don't really need coupons sorted, but it makes her feel good and it takes up time. Perfect, right? Here's some socks. Can you fold them together, right? If she's wearing two different socks one day, does it really matter? Like, we have to sometimes get out of our mind in terms of, like, how things should be done because the benefit of her being socially engaged and feeling like she can do things far outweighs whether or not she's got a gray sock on or black sock on. And to make it even easier, just make sure she's got all kinds of similar socks and it's not a big deal, right? So we, it's really up to us to kind of brainstorm this, but um, it sounds like it's very valuable for her to feel needed and to, for her to help. And so a lots of praise and acknowledgement and asking for her to help in some of these ways would, would I think would be really beneficial. Yeah, I'll definitely bring that up with them. Yeah. So is there her, her dry her body at the end? Like here, here's a hand towel. You can you help dry, you know, after the bath and shower, keep her hands busy, also make sure she's healthy. Yeah, I'll suggest that they have her hold the shampoo and maybe okay, can you pour the shampoo in my hand even if she doesn't they could sure they yeah. they can figure out care- something. And, and that's great. Be careful with it. She might pull out the whole bottle, right? You you get feedback as you go. She might dump the whole bottle. She might the hand entirely. Um, And then you realize, okay, well, maybe that's not a good one. Maybe it's just that she holds a washcloth and rub, you know, rubs her arms. Or maybe it's that she has a bar of soap, you know, so she can, you know, do the soap where it's easier. It's just, it's not a failure. We don't get frustrated. It's just like, that's another piece of, that's another piece to the puzzle. Now I have more information. I've now found my results. Now I know, okay, I can like try this approach next. That sounds awesome. So is there one last tip on dealing with challenging behaviors you want to give people before we talk the rest of the day away? One last tip on dealing with challenging behaviors. You know, um, reach out. Don't reach out to people, friends, family members, support groups, 
don't hang in there alone. And even if it's not, maybe you don't want to talk about dementia at all because it feels like your whole life is revolved around dementia, but just make sure it's really easy to isolate, right? And when you're going and caring for somebody with dementia, like don't lose your own friendships and support systems in the process. So just, you know, whether it's online or in person or through a text message or a phone call or an email, stay connected with the social relationships that are really important to you. Um, the better you feel with your life and as a person, the better equipped you're going to be to handle those difficult dementia behaviors, right? The more stressed you are, the more sad you are, and the more anxious you are, the more difficult it's going to be to handle those behaviors. So do not neglect yourself. That's perfect advice. I try to tell people that all the time, but it's sometimes I feel like because my mom does live in a memory community that, that people don't really hear that. It's like, just because my mom's there doesn't mean I don't feel responsible or I'm not dealing with a lot of these things. I just don't have to deal with it every hour. So I'm glad somebody else can say that. And um, I don't want to leave before I ask you the name of your YouTube channel. Is it Care Blazers? Yeah, if people just type in Care Blazers into Google, my stuff will pop up. It'll be easy to find me. But if you just type Care Blazers into the YouTube, that'll pop up as well. Um, yeah, I've got uh, like a free Care Blazers survival guide. If anybody wants to download it, it's there. I think you, maybe that's how you asked me onto your show. Um, but yeah, free weekly videos every week, um, just answering questions that I see daily in my practice and from, you know, common questions I receive from Care Blazers all over. That's awesome. So they got a podcast to listen to. They got lots of videos they can watch on YouTube. They can watch us on YouTube too. Not that oh, will I, this be on YouTube? Yeah. Um, podcasters are actually kind of really taking over. Uh -huh. Not so much as in dominating, but podcasts, even though they're an audio medium, <clears throat> are kind of swarming onto YouTube because it's the second biggest search engine. Yeah, very so, cool. If you guys want to watch us talk, then you can do that too. <laughs> and like I said, my daughter's almost 28 and she listens to music through YouTube. You know, she doesn't necessarily watch it, but she uses the YouTube app or the, you know, the URL for pretty much all of her entertainment. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. it you know, I use the Zoom app to record. I'm like, and it makes the video. So I'm like, okay, fine. I already have it. I might as well use it. So I know. I wish I would have like prepared better. I didn't realize like this would go. I'm like, do I have a pile of laundry behind me? I know. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> there was one guest. I'm like, do you want to close the closet door? <laughs> uh, yeah. So just make sure, send me the link whenever it's up and post it. I'll make sure to share it with my care blazers and um, maybe they, if anybody else is having challenges with their loved one with bathing and things like this, it might be helpful for them as well. That would be awesome. Well, you have a fantastic weekend. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.